tomorrow. Tomorrow is Saturday.
Hey, Phoebe. Good morning. Yeah, have to be in left here at 422. Yeah. 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 You can hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. All right, so we're going back to chapter 13 because it's 1130. Um, so let's take it from here. What questions do you have about chapter 13 in itself? Um, a book. Do you have the notes? Did you come to class and get the notes? Last week? Sure did, yeah. You did? Yeah, I have. I have. Yeah. Okay. Um, so basically what chapter 13 is talking about is collecting how to collect blood from pediatrics which is babies and from geriatrics which is the older patients you, you know grandmother grandfather the older people not everybody will collect mm. blood work on peds it's usually if you work in a hospital that has a pediatric unit like lafayette general women's and children's uh, Opelousas General, you know, places that have a pediatric center. So there's just a little bit of difference with drawing on peds versus when we draw on an adult. Um, you know how when I teach y'all how to draw, I say tie the tourniquet on, palpitate for vein, untie the tourniquet, get all your stuff together, then tie the tourniquet back, and then proceed with the blood draw. Well, on a pediatric patient, it's a little different. You got to get them to be comfortable with you touching them. Uh -huh. So it's more, more or less a psychiatric thing you have to do with kids. You have to make them first and foremost feel comfortable with you to draw their blood. So sometimes you got to interact with them. You got to talk to them a little while, uh, get to know them a little bit. Like if you notice what cartoon shirt he has on, you ask him, oh, is that your favorite cartoon? And you get him talking about the cartoon. Yeah. The only time we tie the tourniquet on is when we actually going to go ahead and draw on the patient or on a pee. Mm -hmm. um, you're only getting that one shot, pretty much. You very seldom are able to get a second draw on a pediatric patient. So how, how do you... um? I know you said like when we was practicing on with the uh the turn the tourniquet, that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. Said that um we couldn't practice on like a baby because it would mess up their little veins. So how do you do it with them? Uh you do do it with a still a tourniquet. It's just that when you first learning how to tie a tourniquet, sometimes you tend to tie it a little too tight. Oh, okay. That's why I tell y'all not to practice on a on a baby but the more you practice with a tourniquet the more you know the resistance of it you know how tight it can get because it is just a big rubber band yeah so yeah that's why when y'all first learn how to tie a tourniquet i tell y'all don't practice on the little ones because you might hurt their arm or bruise their arm because you tied it too tight but as you gain more experience you know how tight to put it it's just when you're first learning you kind of like you be Superman and make it tight. <laughs> yeah. You make it too tight. Um, so that's why I tell you not to practice on them until you get, you know, a little more comfortable tying a tourniquet. Because like I said, it's not so much the sticking that's the hard part of phlebotomy. It's tying that tourniquet. Yeah. 
find the tourniquet at the right resistance to where you can make a vein pop out, but not tying it so tight it's cutting off the patient's blood circulation. So that's the hardest part of it. And then learning how to stick is the next thing. Okay. So with kids, um, we have to do a little more, you know, play acting, more or less. It's not really play acting. It's just getting them comfortable with you as a yeah. person. Because, you know, most, and I know myself involved, you know, I taught my kids stranger danger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know you. Why are you touching me? You know, is one of those things. So uh, it's just getting that, that pizza to let you even touch their arm. Hold on a minute, Phoebe. Okay. No, you can go in. I was just checking to see where Miss Julia was. Gone for the day. You're welcome. You can hear me? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so that's what that is. To do all that is to get them, you know, emotionally to where they can trust you is what would appear. And as the as the kids get older, you have to change your, you know, your demeanor to them. Especially when you get to those teenagers, they're going to try, yeah. try your patience because they're going to be always in that phone and not really <laughs> talking. They're scared. That's why they're in their phone in the first place. Yeah. So it's trying to get them to open up. It's going to be, you know, and as the patient gets older, you just have to learn how to adapt and get them to trust you to do their labs. So if you remember in all through chapter 13, I had different YouTube videos. The first YouTube video was about pediatric draw. And then the next one was about different positions we would put a pediatric patient in. Now the most common one we use is where we have the parents sitting in the chair and them bear hugging them with the arm that we're gonna draw from extended out. That's the most popular one we use because it gives them a sense of security because their parent is hugging them in a way and it doesn't feel like we're restraining them as much. We're just restraining the one arm versus, you know, yeah. laying on a bed and, we, and the parent has crossed over them. It kind of makes them feel trapped the other way. So. With a pee, also the only, especially any pee that's six or younger, mm -hmm. and depending on the weight too, any pee six or younger, we usually use a butterfly. We always do. That's just well, like smaller. It's smaller and it doesn't, it's still gonna hurt, but it doesn't hurt as much as an eclipse will. Oh, it's shorter. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's shorter and it's smaller. Yeah. So any kids six or under, we will use a butterfly needle on. And we will prep and prepare all equipment away. Not really away, away, but mm -hmm. so the child doesn't see us with the needle. Okay. That's why we don't do the tie, untie. Because once we tie that tourniquet, we're getting ready to stick. Yeah. So they don't be scared? They don't get scared, yes. And we tell them what we're doing as far as, you know, we're going to tie this big... We don't say tourniquet because what kid knows what a tourniquet is? We're yeah. We're going to tie this big blue, white, and different hospitals have different colors tourniquets. Oh, okay. um, We're going to tie this big blue rubber band around your arm. Let me know if it's too tight. And you kind of stretch it out in front of them and let them. Sometimes I would even let them play with it. It's their tourniquet. I'm putting it on them, so I would let them play with it for a little while, just yeah. to get them comfortable with what they needed to get done. Gotcha. <clears throat> and you just, as you go, you're gonna explain the steps to the what you're doing. Um, when you're getting ready to stick, please, whatever you do, don't tell it. Oh, it's just a little stick. No, it's a needle. It hurts. <laughs> Always tell the truth. You gonna feel it's gonna feel like a bee sting. Bee stings hurt. Wall stings. Yeah. You gonna feel a bee sting. 
and you stick and you go with it. Identification of peas is a little more difficult. I mean, it's like how many three-year-olds are going to actually know their full name and their day of birth? Yeah. A, a few if they're more advanced, but yeah. not that many. Um, especially their birthday. They can tell you their yeah. whole name, but yeah. very seldom can tell you their birthday. They can say, I'm three years old. <laughs> I know that. My godson, for the longest, he was like, my name is Ferrante Rondez Jones. I'm three years old. What's your birthday? <laughs> I'm three years old. No, I want to know your birthday. I'm three years old. Oh, okay. You're three years old. Yes, I am. <laughs> he just know he was three years old. <laughs> Knew his whole name. Yeah, my birthday. Birthday didn't know yet. Getting there. He knew he was three. He didn't know his birthday. <laughs> Um, the same thing with newborns. Newborns don't really have a name. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do name them in the hospital, the parent, the you know, the parents. But on yeah. the armband, it'll say the mom's like last name, boy Jones, or baby boy Green, or baby girl Green. You know. Yeah, it that was. Yeah, it doesn't have the child's name. So when we go to identify a newborn, we pretty much have to rely on the parent to say, okay, this is the baby that we're doing lab work on. Yeah. Because now most hospitals keep the baby in the parents. <laughs> they're not in the nursery. The only time they're in the nursery is if the, the pediatrician needs to do an ear test or check the bilirubin or something to that. Yeah, like uh, my daughter, she had to be in a NICU because of her little heart, so she was in a little nursery thing, and then they shipped it to the NICU. Yeah, see, special occasions like that, yeah, they ship them to the yeah. NICU. So, yeah. So, another thing with peds, especially peds who have long-term stay in the hospital, we always mm -hmm. have to be mindful of the location of where we draw a pediatric patient their room is considered a safe haven this is where they mm -hmm. sit, this is where they play they don't associate it with pain but if we do lab work in their room they're going to now associate that room as a pain room it's not their zone of comfort anymore they're not going to mm -hmm. feel comfortable in there so most hospitals who have terminally ill you know patients or patients who need blood work or whatever they have what we call a treatment room and they'll wheel the patient into the treatment room where we go to do their labs and everything. Mm -hmm. That way they know, okay, I'm about to be wheeled to the treatment room. Okay, this is where I'm going to get my medicine, my shots, and everything else. But the room is where they go for comfort. Mm -hmm. So we never, ever draw one in the room. There's always some type of treatment room. Um, so I told you about equipment. We would get the equipment ready, not facing the child, but making sure that the parent knows that everything we're pulling out is fresh and brand new. Mm -hmm. you know, that it is sterile, that we are not, you know, reusing. Yeah. yeah. Everything. Is now, sometimes we deal with combative patients, being it a pediatric or a an adult with special needs because you know an adult with special needs sometimes acts like a five-year-old yeah. you know, yeah. 35 years old but yeah. they act like a five-year-old so mm -hmm. sometimes they can be combative especially you know those adults who suffer from severe autism mm -hmm. and I, when i say severe autism is to the fact that every minute of their life is that is detailed down to a science and sometimes if you deviate from that routine, they become yeah. combative or self-explosive. They start beating themselves up or something to that point. Mm -hmm. so, um, usually if we do encounter something like that, doctors usually give that patient a sedative to kind of keep them calm to do their lab. <coughs> so you can That's some medicine? Yeah, it's a medicine. Oh. Yeah, it's a uh, sedative that kind of keeps them calm. And it, uh, there are certain ones um, that they prescribe that they know they can prescribe to their patients. Okay. 
But if you go into a peace room and they become combative to where they just throw in a whole tantrum, hissy fit, mm -hmm. we don't go ahead and draw them anyway. We inform the nurse in charge of that patient. Mm -hmm. And um, hey, look, he's just being too rambunctious. He's throwing a tantrum. He's kicking. He's screaming. He's storming. I can't calm him down. He's not being respond, you know, very cooperative. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid if I draw on him, he's going to hurt himself, much less myself, me. Mm -hmm. And we never want to do that. So usually we'll tell the charge nurse or we'll call the doctor, and then the doctor will either give him uh, some kind of sedative to calm, keep him calm until mm -hmm. we go back and draw the labs, you know, so we can go back and draw labs. Yeah. You never do that. Now on some peds, you've seen our um, evacuated tubes, the tubes we use in the lab. Now on mm -hmm. day, we can't use those big old tubes. They don't produce enough blood. Newborns don't produce, I mean, they produce enough for their little body some function, yeah. but they don't produce enough to where we can pull that big old tube. So we would do a micro capillary collection, meaning we would do a heel step and collect oh, okay. it a micro collection tube. Those itty bitty little tubes, I think I showed y'all a few of them in class when we were going over tubes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, those small ones. The little bitty ones, yeah. We would do a heel stick on the lateral side of the heel, uh, never ever in the middle because there's a planter's bone in the middle of a baby's heel. And if we damage that planter's bone, it causes the baby not to be able to walk or delay walk. So we always do the outside of the heel area when we do the heel stick. And I'm sure you've seen it when they did it to your little one. Yeah. To do her PKU, which is one of the tests that we do perform on newborns uh, is PKU. We collect for PKUs. PKUs is like the most difficult blood work we have to collect on newborns because what it is is a card. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a card that has four layers to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we have to put, and we have to put, a, and it's like four or five dots. I'm not, I can't remember offhand. It's been a while since I've seen a PKU card. My, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, it's been a while. I think it's four or five. I'm not sure. I can't remember offhand. I think it's four or five. five. Four or five little circles along this card that we have to saturate. And why PKUs are so hard to obtain is due to the fact that we have to make sure that we collect enough blood to saturate all the way through all four layers, mm -hmm. messy enough to where each sample is bleeding over to the next sample circle. So, it mm -hmm. got, and you don't want to underfill it, meaning you didn't completely fill in the whole circle, but you don't want to overfill it either to where it's merging onto the next circle. So, mm -hmm. you always be mindful and fill it according, you know, to where you can make sure it goes through all four, but not overfill it to where it's bleeding over to the next circle. Because mm -hmm. you only have two weeks to perform a PKU test. And most of the time we try to catch them while they're in the hospital because I know when I had my little ones, mm -hmm. after I left the hospital, I was not walking out of my house with a newborn. <laughs> yeah. So it was they sleep schedules all crazy. My sleep schedule all crazy. <laughs> they never act the same when they get home as they in the hospital. In the hospital, they sleep all night. But the minute you come mm -hmm. home, they forget how to sleep all night. That's what, like she was, cause I like she, the crazy like to believe it or not, she was up during the day and slept in the night until she got a certain age. Then she wanna start cutting up. <laughs> Yeah. See, my, my daughter, my youngest one, yeah, once mm -hmm. I got her home, that was, that was all cake with those. She'll sleep all day, and no matter how much I play with her or anything to keep her up, she sleeps yeah. <laughs> all night. Eat and, mm -mm. <laughs> her crib at all. Sleep, put her down in her crib, put her little music on, 
five minutes later, you hear her tossing and turning and about to let out a big old scream. Mm -hmm. So um, with, pre with um, prenatal screening, of course, you notice the PKU. And basically what the PKU is, is looking for is any genetic disorders that might be found in the PKU. They want to catch them early enough to correct them because after, if it goes on too long, it's irreversible. Catch it early, they okay. can reverse it. Catch it too late, they can't reverse it. It's done. Um, what is a PKU? A PKU test for... Like what it is, like what it is for a baby? Hmm? It's a series. Yeah, like what is it for the baby? Well, it, PKU is a series of tests. It's like a panel. It tests for, uh, oh, okay. yeah, it's oh, different like, things. Okay. Yeah, it tests for different things. You're breaking up, Phoebe. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Yeah, you was breaking up too. I was saying, uh, yeah, I thought it was for just one specific thing, but it's for uh, just one. I mean, more than one. Yeah, it's more than one. And I don't have my headset, so that's why I don't. I can't. I'm trying to talk loud. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you're looking in notes, I have what test, what is in, incorporated into a newborn screening. You have HIV, HIV, cystic fibrosis, uh, congenital, uh, a, yeah. it breaks it down, sickle cell, Congenital hypothyroidism, mm -hmm. maple syrup urine disease, where actually a baby's urine smells like maple syrup. That's not good. <laughs> what is not good? Not good. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it smells good, but no, that's not, <laughs> not good. Not good. Not good. Not good. Not good at all. Well, I ain't know that could happen. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, when we do do micro collection, mm -hmm. uh, collecting, there are certain tests that we can perform and we can't perform on those micro collection tubes. Mm -hmm. um, we can do anything under the sun except blood cultures and um, ESRs or type in cross match because it's not enough blood. We can't. Um. Do we can't do coagulation testing, mm -hmm. and we can't monitor uh, drug do mo drug monitoring or ammonia levels on a capillary collection because it's not enough blood to test it. So mm -hmm. those are the ones we would actually have to go ahead and stick a, a newborn for with a needle. Mm -hmm. Besides, you know, doing a heel stick. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And that's pretty much it on pediatrics. Now, the way I describe geriatrics, you know, geriatrics and pediatrics are pretty much the same. They're just mm -hmm. older. <laughs> like they're older and more verbal. Yeah. Um, you pretty much treat your geriatrics the same way as you treat your pediatrics. <laughs> Especially the more, the older they are, and the more of a health risk they are, uh, especially patients who have dementia or Alzheimer's, they really can become really combative sometimes, or mm -hmm. really, you know, apprehensive of you touching them because they don't know who you are. As a matter of fact, they don't even know how their own family members have to yeah. die. So they're pretty much the same way. I treat them the same way as PDP. You know, you talk to them. Baby. They like babies. They're just older. Yeah. yeah. And they hurt when they hit. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> no, they're weak. Oh, they're not that, they don't hurt that much. Another thing when we deal with geriatric patients, um, some have severe arthritis. So it kind of makes it mm -hmm. hard to draw sometimes because they can't flex the arm. Or oh, God. Their arm out all the way because of the arthritis. Yeah. Uh, some patients might suffer from Parkinson's. So they constantly have a body tremor. So it makes mm -hmm. it kind of hard to draw on them because they're always trembling. So you got to catch them at a time when they're not 
as trembling, trembling as much. Um, and then, of course, it talks about Alzheimer's. Mm-hmm. When we deal on geriatrics, we have a big old um, format we have to play with when it comes to them. All right, so with Jerry's, we just have to be a little more careful because even if we do use a butterfly needle, the older they get, especially if they're bed bound and they're not moving around as much, we can act inintentionally bruise them. It's not that we mean to bruise them, it's just yeah. that the skin is so paper thin and so frail. Even when we use a butterfly, which we all know is the smallest needle we have, in the phlebotomy, we still have a tendency to bruise them a little bit. Another thing we have to deal with with the geriatrics is hard of hearing. As y'all know, I have a soft spoken voice. It's hard for me sometimes to project out. I've learned as I've taught, you know, the years that I taught, I've learned to get a little louder. <laughs> Not much, but a little louder than usual. Um, so hearing law, patients who have hearing loss, you have to talk louder and clearer yeah. so they can hear you. I, you don't like this. Hmm? Well, I'm like, so, like, well, I'm like soft spoken too. Like people can't, I'll be thinking people can hear me, but they can't. Yeah, my sister always fusses at me. You're mumbling. No, I'm not. I'm talking. Yeah, that's how, that's how I do. <laughs> She's constantly saying, you're mumbling. I can't hear you. All I hear is wah, 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 wah. And I'd be like, I'm just so tempted sometimes to tell her, well, clean out your ears. But I know, I know she cleans out her ears because she's always walking yeah. with a Q-tip in her, stuck in her ear. So I know she cleans her ears. So I can't really say that. Yeah. It's just sometimes I don't project out. Um, so we have to learn how to speak loud. But yeah. um, failing eyesight, sometimes they can't see you. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you have to be, you know, be able to, you know, lightly touch them and say, hey, I'm over here at at all times. Yeah. Always be aware of your patient's health uh, condition. Because as they get older, sometimes they lose their sense of taste, smell and feeling so they can't feel. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they become Mm -hmm. uh, malnutrition are dehydrated so it makes it very hard for us to draw especially if they're dehydrated no matter if they have a good vein and it may not flow like it's flowing yeah, it's hard. yeah it makes it hard sometimes especially as they get older um patients with memory loss alzheimer's um, sometimes <laughs> remember the first and last name or where they were like or much less how old they are are they birthday? Yeah. So that's when we have to rely on the nurse to identify the patient because they can't do it themselves. Yeah. Um, muscle mass, they not, might not be able to hold their arm up or anything. So mm. um, yeah. sometimes you have patients who suffer from what we call hyper, um, hypothermia. They stay cold. Mm-hmm. You walk in a room and it's mm-hmm. like you're in a sauna. But when you go to touch the patient, <laughs> after you pull them out from under, cold. under their 10,000 heated blankets, their body tells you, <laughs> I mean, ice cold, like frigid cold. But it's a sauna mm-hmm. in their room and they have like 10 blankets on them. And and I've known this firsthand because I used to draw at a um, retirement center. And I had one patient. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I stripped before I even walked in her room. All I, I If it's a mm-hmm. day and I have a jacket on, I already know. Take every, take the jacket off. Take, yeah. Just to take off. roll up the sleeves, take off the jacket, and tie it around your waist, and, and you still yeah. wear the sweat. <laughs> Because it's that hot in there, that hot, and the door is closed, so it's really hot. So we have to be mm-hmm. more like that, which is more difficult 
draw too because that means that the veins are really constricted meaning they're they they're really really little, little they're itty bitty so usually if i had a patient that was like that i would get like a clean towel. yeah i would get a clean towel and run hot water yeah. i'm sorry no uh just saying that you get a towel and warm it up yeah yeah, I would get a towel and warm it up, or I take one of their heated blankets and wrap it around their arm, and just massage it until I can get something going. Uh, or I would take the alcohol prep and just, cause um, I don't know if I told this to your class or somebody else. If you take an al alcohol prep, sometimes if you rub it across the vein, it'll mm -hmm. make the blood circulate because rubbing alcohol. Um, if you ever noticed, rubbing alcohol is like a soother. Yeah. So it'll make your blood start pumping. So sometimes I'll do that but along with a warm towel just to get something to pop up or something to unconstrict so I can. Yeah. So it, would it help? I, for a little while. Long, <laughs> enough to, long enough for me to get the labs. Oh, okay. Yeah. That one area would be warm enough to get labs and then she'd be back cold within the next <laughs> She just they just suffer from hypothermia. There's nothing we can really do. do about it. Yeah. Um, there's nothing we can do. They, do they do they tremble? Like do they shake? No, no they're not do cold. They're they just cold to the touch. Oh, okay. No, they're not trembling. They teeth not chattering or nothing else. They just feel cold all the time. Oh. <clears throat> so that's pretty much it for peds and geriatrics everything pretty much stays the same um mm -hmm. you know you gotta do the hand washing before and after you gotta wear your gloves you gotta make sure you have sterile equipment after you do your blood draw you know it's gotta go in the bot inverted then put in a bio bag i mean you pretty much got all that part of it yeah um, it's just you have to be mindful of the psychiatric and physical determinants of an old person versus a newborn and a pediatric patient. So that's yeah. much chapter 13 in a nutshell. That was it. That was it. Well, I understand it more. Good. Good. That's the whole idea. So what I'll try to do now that I have a little condenser now class that they split off because I had over 45 students. So it was kind of hard. Yeah, it was kind of hard for me because. Yeah, for one person. Well, it's not just for one person. It's just that I would try to get a group of y'all. Yeah. Everybody has different schedules. So I have to find a central time because I still, oh, okay. still got to put grades in. I still got to keep up with y'all grades. I got to, you know, I have other stuff. I have to because I have, I have. Well, Monday through Thursday. Well, now I only have labs on Monday, Wednesday. Oh, that's another thing for you. Labs are going to change. Um, okay. Because I have can put up to 10 students now. So mm -hmm. my, my, my labs are only going to be broken down to Monday, Wednesday. Okay. So what about, oh, so that's going to be the, um, the class days too? Yeah. Monday will be lab day. Wednesday will be class time. Okay. Yeah. So that doesn't change. As far as so, so how many you got? Now? Um, I have twenty one. Oh, okay. Well, that's not bad at all. I can handle that. I mean, I was, <laughs> I was handling over the forty. But yeah, I, but but I can tell you know the ones that I needed to sit down and do a little more with. I, mm -hmm. I couldn't find the time to do it, and now I can. That way, y'all don't fall behind, or y'all feel like, man, I'm not getting this, or. Yeah, it's, that, was, that was my issue, but, like, now I could be able to start, like, more, doing more with my with it. Yeah. All right. If you want, we can break down Chapter 14. Chapter 14 test is easy. Chapter 14 is easy peasy. All it is is point of care testing. Your glucose monitoring, your, your cholesterol monitoring, and basically it's just telling you about the different types of point of care testing that they have available in the lab. And I kind of broke it down already um, mm -hmm. on the post. I posted it because I did a Zoom on chapter 14 already. I just didn't get a chance to record it. 
uh, I couldn't get it to record for some strange reason, but I gave the page number and what I referenced to on each thing. So if you look on the post, I think I posted it yesterday. On a moto? In a moto, yeah. And I told you what specific things to look in on chapter 14. Now, I'm not saying don't read the whole chapter of chapter 14. I'm just saying yeah. there's certain points I want you to mainly focus on on chapter 14. And I also put a practice test on there also. Uh, that was on... What things about them? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry? So the only thing about them PowerPoints, I don't get it for some reason. Maybe I got to do it on a laptop because I'll be on my phone. Yeah, a laptop, it comes out. I think when I do it on a laptop. Yeah. And that way you can oh, okay. see the whole well, picture. I got a laptop. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? The lecture should have came out today for Chapter 14. Yes. See it. Yeah. Do we have to write? I need to know, like, for them, for the, like, when you do that, do we have to write some on that? Because sometimes, like, it'd be like. Well, sometimes um, I forget to take the check off that says, do um, you want this added to the grade book? I, and I'd be like, no. And then sometimes I forget to take it off because it mm -hmm. all, it's automatically set to add to the grade book. But if I ever forget to take the check off, just put done. And yeah, yeah, that's what I put. That's what I put. Yeah. Basically, the lectures are for you to write your own notes. Mm -hmm. Give it a study. And I mean, I do give y'all a set of notes, but chapter 14 doesn't have a set of notes because pretty much everything in this chapter is important. Mm -hmm. I, I just gave you, um, like I said, in that breakdown in that post, I just gave you the most important, you know, the things I really wanted y'all to concentrate on. Yeah. Yeah. And then on the study questions, that's what I gave you, like sample test questions that might be on the test. Okay. Yeah. That's a kitchen. Right. You get to see me. You're with me. You don't switch over to Miss Julia. Sounds good. All right. And I'll be posting. <laughs> All right. Between now and the weekend, the lab, the new lab schedule. All right. All right. So. All right. I will see you on Monday. You are coming at what time? Well, it'll be on there. I'll try to get you in the morning because I know you like mornings. Okay, yeah, I do. Yeah, so I'll have it all posted by this weekend. I'm going to work on it a little in a little bit. Okay.